Welcome to the MYS Virtual Hangout. Here's your host, MYS Music Director, Raul Gomez. Good afternoon and welcome to Hangout number 53. My guest this afternoon is an institution of music, performance and teaching here in Portland and beyond, Hamilton Chaffetz. He's a professor of cello at Portland State University where he has been since the late 70s. And uh, most of you know him if you live here in Portland uh, and if you have anything to do with music. But if you don't, I'm very excited for you to get to know him uh, right here on the MYS Hangout. Hamilton, welcome to the MYS Virtual Hangout. Hi, Raul. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. So I have a, a my, my first question to you is kind of weird. I'm a little embarrassed to ask, but what's what's the correct way to pronounce your last name? Is it Chaffetz or, or Chaffetz? Well, first, don't be embarrassed because uh, <laughs> I've heard everything. Okay. Uh, my last name is the same name as Chaffetz, like Yasha Chaffetz. Okay. But Chaffetz is an Americanization of a Russian Jewish name, which is Chaffetz. Chaifetz. And so it's it's uh, it's not A or I. And in Russia, they call him Yasha Chaifetz. Um, so I say Chaifetz. But if somebody calls me Chaifetz, I'm always happy because when I was 12 years old, I said to my father, Dad, I want to start pronouncing my last name Chaifetz because I thought it sounded more distinguished and more like Chaifetz. Yeah, yeah. My father just looked at me and pointed his finger and said, your name is Chaffetz. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's not speak of this again. Uh, so in other words, you can call me anything. Else, okay. Just call me. Okay. <laughs> well, but so you were saying you were 12 when you, when you told your dad that. That's right. That's right. Uh, were you already playing the cello at that point? I started when I was seven to play the cello. And, and I, yeah. My mother was a really fine violinist. And, uh, my father used to accompany her on the piano. Yeah. Uh, I have a brother and a sister, so my mother was a, a busy mom and she didn't have any time to like really go far in uh, being a serious violinist, but all through her childhood and through high school, um, she played and I, she died when I was nine years old. Okay. Um, but I remember her playing very, very well. And um, she was a very fiery player, a very warm player. And my father and mother were involved in uh, what was called the Workers' Cooperative Colony in Chicago. It's like kind of a socialist uh, uh, people's movement. And they would have sometimes rallies, organizational things. And my mom would go play Zigunerweisen. Ah. Um, that was kind of her war horse. Well, I mean, that's not an easy piece to play. No, she was, she was clearly a, a, an accomplished she player. Was wonderful. And she actually chose the cello for me because she loved the cello. And we lived in Chicago. My parents went to New York on a vacation. They came back in the middle of the night and woke me up in the middle of the night. And my father was standing next to the bed and he had the cello behind his back. And I still can see him standing there. I saw the edges of the cello in a case. Yeah, yeah. A soft case sticking out. And I was like, what's that? And he said, this is a present. And the next day was September 4th. So I'm celebrating my, uh, my cello birthday right around now. <laughs> wow. And uh, the next day was the first day of school. I was in first grade and, uh, or second grade. I, first grade, I don't know second grade. So I ran home from school because I couldn't wait to try to play a few notes. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I sounded horrendous. Uh, <laughs> but my parents were very wise. And they got me a teacher right away. I started lessons right away. And they also said, you should practice five minutes a day at least hmm. five minutes. And then it was 10 minutes, then it was 15 minutes. But they were not like some parents were like, okay, 
you know, two hours a day. Sure, sure. So, so they gradually, <laughs> but you know, they didn't have to force the issue. I really wanted to try to learn. And uh, it just seemed like the most uh, marvelous toy that I'd ever received. And uh, as I say, I mean, I sounded, I can still hear how horrible I sounded then, but, but you know, I practiced, so yeah, I, I got better. Did you play any instruments before that? I mean, I there was a piano. piano at home. I played piano. Yeah, okay. But as soon as I got the cello, I was not at all interested in the piano, and I was never uh, um, driven or, or that fond of playing piano, and I never really had piano lessons. I mean, in Chicago, they had this class called Music for Children. Yeah. And when I was like five years old, I would go to these classes, and they would have the children march around. They say, okay, this is a piece in, in two, it's a march, and so march around. And then this is in three, this is like a dance thing. And, and yeah, so I learned a little about music. And then uh, when I got the cello, I already could read music. And, and, uh, and my first teacher almost spoke no English. She was a French young woman. Um, but you know, music is a universal language. Um, so she showed me, demonstrated what to do, and uh, she was very kind to me. And uh, yeah, and so that that's that's how I started. My mother loved Heifetz's playing, and Oistra. So in the house, always records were on. Yeah, and from the time I was tiny, I heard Heifetz, and a lot, and. Uh, for me, Heifetz is still the greatest string player who ever lived and, and is thrilling to me to listen to and always like moving and not just technically perfect and awesome, but full of soul and, and, yeah. uh, and passion. So, so I was fortunate that way. Did you listen to any cellists uh, regularly? I did. Well, when I started playing cello, I did. Yeah. My father and I would go to the record store and we bought the box suites with Casals. And eventually, um, we listened to all the greatest cellists of the time then, which were Pierre Fournier and my teacher later, Janos Starker, yeah. and Piatigorsky, of course. Um, and, and also, I was in Chicago. so. I went to the Chicago Symphony Young People's Concerts, and when I got a little older, maybe around 12, 13, my father and I would go to the symphony, and I watched Pierre Fournier play a concerto, and I saw Andre Navarra, and uh, uh, some great, great artists, you know. So when you started to study with Starker, you clearly knew who he was. I mean, he was one of the great oh, cellists yeah, in the world. I worked at this thing, yeah. yeah. How did you end up studying with one of your idols? Well, it was amazing and, and uh, a great blessing in my life. Um, from the time I was about 12 years old, I studied with Joe Saunders, who was a cellist in the Chicago Symphony, and Starker, before he became world famous soloist was principal of Chicago Symphony. Mm. And so Saunders knew Starker. And Saunders was a great teacher for me. Saunders used to uh, give me two or three lessons a week. He lived about two blocks from our house. He would just drop in unannounced after supper and say, play your Sansons concerto for me. And uh, and then I'd have a normal lesson, and he'd say, okay, here's a fingering. This is how Leonard Rose played this. This is how Pierre Fournier played it. He'd give me another fingering. So here are a couple choices. And uh, he wrote a letter to Starker after a few years and said, I really think you should hear this kid. Yeah. And I'm sure when Starker read the letter, he rolled his eyes because I'm sure he got, got a lot of letters like that. But because he knew my teacher then, Joe Saunders, we arranged uh, for me to audition for him, to play for him. Yeah. 
And uh, we were in Chicago. He was in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a five-hour drive. So we just drove to Indiana. It was in, I think, February. It was very snowy, and and, uh, and I went into his studio, and uh, I played the prelude of the sixth box suite. And then the Almond of that same sixth suite. And then the first movement of Lalo Concerto. And when I finished, she said, uh, if an angel should come down and tell you you could be anything you want, what would you say? <laughs> and, and without a, missing a beat, I gave him the honest answer, which is, I would say, I'd like to be like you. <laughs> because, I mean, for from my impressions of his recordings, he was above everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, his playing was so clean and and effortless sounding, and and um, then he had all his students come in for the master class that was every Saturday. And so I sat for two, two and a half hours listening to his students play for him, and they were all really good. Mm -hmm. And also he demonstrated all the time. And while he was demonstrating for them, he would be playing something very difficult. And while he was playing it, he would just be talking to them about what to think about. And it, the talking was completely independent of what he was yeah. doing. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. It was unbelievable. And when the class ended, he turned to me and said, take your cello out and play the prelude of the Bach for us, which he hadn't told me he was going to do. Mm. This was a little test. <laughs> he wanted to see what I was made of. Yeah. And so I dug in and, and I played the prelude with some uh, conviction. Starker was not a man to give compliments at all. I mean, a rare thing he would say is most of the chillistic problems seem to have been solved. He wouldn't say that was excellent or good work <laughs> or I liked it or, or you know, yeah. you're on the right track, nothing like that. But when I finished playing the prelude, he looked at his students and he said, it's nice to know that there's good cello playing somewhere besides Bloomington, Indiana. And the students all would, <laughs> the new so, kid. It was a memory. Yeah. A memory. And then I started studying with him just uh, about five months after that. And how long were you his student? My whole life. But uh, sure. at first I was in Indiana for two and a half years. Yeah. And uh, he was very busy concertizing, but... When he was in Indiana, he taught a big, big class. And during the time I was studying with him, I was not always having a very easy time doing what I wanted to do. Getting to class, practicing enough. Yeah. Um, I was young and uh, it was my first time away from home. So. At the end of two and a half years, I decided to go back to Chicago for a while to regroup sure. and try to like figure out what was the obstacle to my doing what I wanted to do. And I was very fortunate that I started getting work. I started earning money with the cello, and uh, and not so long after that, I got a job in the Lyric Opera of Chicago and. I was assistant principal, I was 19 years old, and we were playing things like Rosenkavalier and Salome, <laughs> so guess who had to practice? <laughs> I had to practice a lot, and so, so that really saved me. Sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you say your whole life you were a student of his, do you mean it in the sense that, you know, you're always looking back at those teachings or, or did you continue to go back to him to play for him with, with some regularity? Not regularity, but sometimes I would go to see him yeah. uh, 
just to ask him some questions or maybe play a little bit. Um, but I guess what I really mean is that uh, Starker was a genius. Um, his teaching was so detailed and not only did he tell us what to do, but he also told us how to solve problems. Yeah. Because he knew that after a number of years, we would not be with him, and then our problems would not be over. And so he taught us an approach. So when a problem came up, a lot of it having to do with knowing how to release tension, the same thing we all fight, um, and also musical principles. Um, so every time I pick up the cello, He's inside me, and he's with me, yeah. and, you know, I'm not a young man, but I feel wonderful when I play, and I have lots of friends who are my age or younger who can't really play anymore sure. because they hurt themselves. So, and, you know, he was like my second father. Yeah. I mean, if not for Starker, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you because he helped me get my first job in the trio with Carol Sindel in Wisconsin. And then when we auditioned to come here in the 1970s, he wrote a letter saying, you would do well to hire this guy. Um, and it was that letter that is the reason I got the job. I mean, I could play okay, but... Um, People paid attention to uh, a letter from Janusz Stalker. Sure. <laughs> so, so, I mean, honestly, I would not be sitting here, and I don't think I, I would be uh, necessarily able to play and function yeah. if I hadn't worked with him or someone like him. I mean, there are a lot of really wonderful cello teachers in the world now, but um, I really hit it off with him and... and uh, he was a perfect teacher for me. Yeah. And so you said when you played for him for that first audition, you played Bach and you played Lalo. Uh, is that, did he request that? Did no, he no. request? He said, what, he said, what do you have? Oh, okay. So this is just what you, you're, you and your teacher had yeah, been. Yeah. Yeah. I had been working on those pieces for a yeah. while. Okay. Yeah. So like, uh, m you know, many string players, cellos, violinists, violists, uh, this music by Bach is a lifelong companion. And uh, recently you posted a video on Facebook that I, I've watched and uh, loved. And that's a short video of you playing Bach. And uh, you were kind enough to let us share that recording here on this Hangout. So I wanted to ask if you would be willing to introduce that video before we play it. Sure. It was about a week ago or so, I recorded the Sarabande from the first Bach cello suite. I came down here, I'm in my studio at PSU, the building's totally empty, I'm very careful down here. Yeah. Um, and I try to practice every day, and I don't practice at home because I live with my wife and our two grown sons and two golden retrievers, and it's just... There's no place for the cello and me there. <laughs> also, I like to work here and and work well and then go home and enjoy my family. Um, so I always practice some scales and, and then something very strenuous to stay in shape even during time of COVID. Um, and that day I just felt like playing that Cervant. So I played through it. And I just had a feeling of gratitude. So I went across the hall to a classroom that's uh, cooler than my room because I still don't have the AC on in this building. Oh, okay. And right. you can see there's a lot of light shining in the skylight here. And, and uh, so it gets quite warm in here. So I went across the hall to a big empty classroom. I put my iPhone on the stand and I just played through the Cerebon one time. And, and I played it very slowly because I wanted it to last as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> well, I thought it's, I mean, you, you guys watching this will hear it. I, I, I just thought it was such a soulful and just beautiful performance of, of this piece. So uh, let's take a listen. <laughs> So Bach and Hamilton, as you know, we were saying before, this music that is always with us as string players. And I'm curious about your relationship with the Bach cello suites, uh, you know, throughout your life and your career, and whether that's a relationship that has changed, and if so, how? It keeps changing. Um... I mean, as a child, as I told you, I listened to Casals and Fournier and Starker. Three great artists all say very, very differently. Mm. And, uh, and then I'll tell you a story. Um, in the 1990s, it was the early 90s maybe, or the late 80s, I went to a World Cello Congress. And this was in Indiana. And Anna Bilsma, the great Baroque cellist who was Dutch, came out and gave a lecture demonstration, played the entire fourth cello suite. And before every movement, he talked. Mm -hmm. And after every movement, he talked some more. Do you know Bilsma's playing at all? Do you know who that is? I'm not familiar. Well, he recorded the suites several times always very different than the other recordings. And he played uh, with great understanding. And, uh, and he talked a lot about choices, about how a lot of cellists slur a lot of notes. And that wasn't really the Baroque way. Or maybe cellists use a great deal of vibrato. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of controversy about what they did. If anybody ever tells me they they know what they did, I always say, really? How do you know? <laughs> I mean, were you there? Did you hear a recording, how they played back in the 18th century? And um, I've, I've read now some, like Leopold Mozart's uh, long essay about early classical 
and late Baroque performance practice about what people did back then. Um, and for me, Bill's most presentation was something of a revelation. Mm. Um, he demonstrated two ways in the Allemande of the fourth suite. First, he played it very legato, which was the way I always played it. And he said, you could play it like this. And he played it. And there were a thousand people in the auditorium and all of the, a thousand cellists nodded their head. Yeah, that's how I do it. And he said, but that would be boring. <laughs> and then instead of playing, da 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 he played, da 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 And I thought, that's so much more interesting. Uh-huh. It brings out two voices. And, you know, all these heads were like, no, oh, no, 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 that's not. Uh, so some people were very upset by what he said. But look, um, Starker used to say the definition of a masterpiece is you can play it with vibrato or without vibrato. You can play it legato or very detached. You can play fast or slow or in between or loud or soft, and it still sounds like a great piece, <laughs> unless you're a musical idiot. Sure. If you play a piece by Bach, it sounds like a great piece, as opposed to an inferior piece, which you have to play a certain way and then it sounds great. Right. But if you don't play it in that way, it sounds like a stupid piece. So that always was comforting to us to hear that. Um, and also, I grew up listening to the Casals master classes on TV. And Casals felt like Bach was the man. Mm-hmm. And that everything came from Bach. And that Bach contained all human emotion and experience. And he always said to people, don't fear Bach. Hmm. He said, the purest. And he would make a face, the purest. <laughs> scandalized by how I play Bach, and then he would just smile. Yeah. Um, that's what the purists are for. Um, I always try to get my students to listen to Casal, because maybe you don't want to do exactly how he did it, but Casal's never played a, an uninteresting measure in his life. Mm. He always looks for the shape and expression in every note and every measure, and so um, I mean, to, to sum up, um, I've been playing the first Bach Suite since I was about 10 years old, maybe. So that's many decades now. And I still am finding new things in it. So, oh, I didn't realize that was like a voice leading over here. And, and, uh, yeah. and sometimes I'll played this way and sometimes I'll try something different tempo or using very, very little vibrato. Um, so I'm, I'm open to uh, growing and experimenting. Yeah. And I love that. And that's something we talk about with, you know, our students or, 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 or you know, my personal students also how we're so lucky that there's no end to that learning and exploration in music, right? And like we are all perpetual students, or or at least we should be. <laughs> well, that's that's I relate to that. Okay, Starker used to refer to becoming a musician as climbing a ladder that goes infinitely into the sky, mm-hmm. and he said, "You see the top rung of the ladder." or what you see as the top rung. And you work for years and years and years, and you get to that rung, and you go, all right. (laughs) And then you look up, and there's 10 or 20 more rungs of the ladder. Then you have to decide, okay, so now do I keep climbing? And then you keep climbing, years more goes on, and then you get to the top of that. And again, you celebrate, and then you look up, and there's still more ladder. He said, you can stop whenever you want. Sure. (laughs) But 
Yeah, yeah, there's no end. The, there's no end. You know, the curiosity that, uh, you know, just, you can just keep going as long as you want. Um, there's another video, Hamilton, that uh, I'm excited to show our viewers that you shared with me. So would you mind introducing that one, please? Yes, this is kind of an oddity. This is a piece by a cellist who, whose name was Ennio Bolognini. And I'll tell you a little bit about him because he was quite a character. Ennio Bolognini was from Argentina. And uh, at one point he was uh, principal Chicago Symphony. Um, he was also the sparring partner of the welterweight champion of, of Argentina. Oh. So he was a boxer. And on the record it said, and he is also a licensed airplane pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and he pedals his racing bike at speeds approaching those of Franco Giorgetti of racing fame. I was like, what a guy, you know, this guy, what, what, a, what a man. And so um, he also played flamenco guitar and he wrote a bunch of original pieces for cello that employ some flamenco techniques. Um, None of those pieces has ever been published because Bolognini liked this young Russian cellist named Kristina Valeska, who is still with us. And he gave them to her, the music. And he said, I'll give you this music, but you have to promise me you will never, ever give this music to anyone else. Whoa. And you'll never publish these pieces. So. My teacher, Joe Saunders, used to tell me there was this crazy guy, Bolognini. He used to do flamenco type things on the cello and he would show me a couple little things. And I go, wow, that's so cool. And later I found a record called The Magic Sounds of Bolognini. And he has some of his pieces on there. He also had a recording of Scherzo Tarantel by Vinyasky. And he recorded it. And then he sped it up twice as fast. <laughs> it sounded like a violin, you know, and put it on the record. That's and, funny. And I just cracked up when I heard that. But the cello pieces were astounding to me. So back when I was in my 30s, I spent many hours listening to this one piece called Serenata del Gaucho. I listened to it over and over and over, and I learned it by ear, most of it, mm. because there were some things he did on that record I still don't know how the heck he was doing, yeah, yeah, but he did. But I kind of learned it after my fashion, and I used to like playing it a whole lot. Um, and then I didn't play it since 1989, was the last time I played it until recently. I played it in Sydney, Australia. Mm. and. Uh, a friend of mine happened to be at that concert in Sydney, Australia, and about a month ago or something, he posted a video on YouTube of that performance from Sydney from 1989. Of you playing. Of me playing yeah. that piece. And he loved that piece so much, my friend. <laughs> so I watched myself playing this. I had no memory of even playing that piece in Sydney. Wow. But in Sydney, I did a recital at the Opera House, and I played uh, Debussy Sonata and uh, and uh, a Beethoven Sonata, some Schubert leader that I had arranged. But then later, in a more informal concert, I played this Serenata del Gaucho. So I thought, boy, that piece is fun. Yeah. I wonder if I could still play that piece. Okay. So then I spent a few weeks trying to learn it again by ear and trying to remember the, the techniques. And, uh, and I almost got there and I'm still almost there. But when I got it to it sounded sort of decent, I went across the hall and uh, I recorded it. So that's the piece. And I posted it on uh, Facebook or whatever. And cellists are saying, Oh, that's such a great piece. Do you have the music? You know, can I get the music? And like, I wish I had the music, but there is no music. Wow. So I had to learn it by ear. 
And um, and then, you know, I told them the story of uh, Bolognini giving it to this glamorous young Russian cellist, and, and, uh, and that's the story of the piece. So presumably, I mean, the, it's written down, and this lady has that. Yes. Those materials, I'll okay. In some form. Okay. But, but uh, she's still alive, and I'm not sure that it will ever be published. Yeah, because yeah. maybe he said, "This is only for you," you know. Sure. And and so. But they are yeah. recorded. I mean, he played them. He recorded them. So they are around. So, okay. <laughs> well, I, di I didn't realize that you were playing this just by ear. That's that's really cool. And it's, yeah, very, very nice. Some, some right. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's take a listen to okay. Serenata del Gaucho by Bolognini.
that was so fun. And le- so gaucho means basically a, like a cowboy from Argentina, right? Is, is what it is. That's what I understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You would know better than I. Right. <laughs> very, very cool. <laughs> so, well, I mean, if not you, somebody needs to, you know, continue like transcribing these or playing them. <laughs> It's a well, wealth of, of pieces. And... Oh, yeah, it, it, it's so much fun. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think we need we need some fun in the world. And, and, and uh, I mean, you have to work hard to learn to play it even, you know, badly. Yeah. But um, but I think it's it's a good stretch. That's why I we learned it because yeah. I wanted to, to, to push myself a little bit. Very cool. Okay, Hamilton, we have a few short, fun segments that we do here at the MYS Virtual Hangout, and I'm looking forward to doing those with you, starting with our game that we play here called Two Truths and a Lie. And uh, viewers of the Hangout are probably familiar with this, but if there's anybody new watching, this is a game that you might know, where we have three statements from our guests that I'm going to put up on on the screen right now. Two of them are true and one of them is a lie. And uh, my job here is to figure out which one is the lie. And if I successfully do that, I win. If I don't, then Hamilton wins. And I'm gonna- I I think we're both going to win. (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna read these out loud uh, and here they are. Statement A, Hamilton played with Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra and the Bee Gees. Statement B, Hamilton toured much of the U.S. with the Paul Winter Consort and occasionally gave his name as Fingers, I'm going to say Buvona. Yeah, that's <laughs> In statement C, Hamilton has never practiced more than three hours a day. So my strategy here is uh, I'm going to try to find one of the truths first. Okay, and that, that way you'll help me out a little bit and then hopefully... Um, I'll be able then to guess the lie. So, um, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, and the Bee Gees. Um, in terms of timeline, I mean, you, you, you came here to Portland uh, in 77, so you're already pretty active, playing probably all kinds of music in the 70s and before. So that's it. I see that, you know, it's, it's possible. B, uh, you know, the, your name... <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's it's great. I really want it to be true. Uh, fingers move on it. Uh, and C, never practice more than three hours a day. Um, which, you know, it sounds unlikely, but maybe it's like a trick uh, answer. Um, because there is something about being efficient and smart uh, practicing. But at the same time, it's hard to imagine that a, a, a young... Hamilton Chaffetz didn't practice more than three hours. I don't know. But um, here's my first guess. I'm, I'm going to say that statement A that you played with Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, and the Bee Gees is true. That's correct. Okay, yes. Okay, so still <laughs> still uh, in the game here. Uh, did you get to uh, chat with it, with any of them? I played with Tony Bennett dozens of times. Oh, you did? And, uh, um, he used to hire two cellists to play in a little band that he had. And uh, we played in Chicago. We played up at the Lake Geneva Playboy Club. Huh. And I was 19, so that was a heady situation for me. <laughs> uh, and, and I practiced my bowling a lot because I left my heart mm, in San Francisco. Mm. So, you know, whole notes, a lot of whole notes. So yeah. I, I worked on my my Boeing, which I'm still working on. Um, I wasn't friends with him exactly, but he was a very nice person, and and uh, um, and I had friends who were in the band, and so that was kind of a fun time. Yeah, I played Sinatra. I only played it one time. They gave a a big concert, which was a benefit for the Italian American community in Chicago. Yeah. And they had a lot of big stars. And I was on stage. There were probably like three or four cellos in that orchestra. And Tony Bennett sang some stuff. And somebody else sang, somebody else. And then I heard this sound like thunder in in the backstage. And it was like 
25 people walking in like a bunch. Yeah. And I looked into the wings and there was Frank Sinatra surrounded by his bodyguards and his whole entourage. And he came out and the place went crazy and he sang Chicago, you know, sure. Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> so, and that's all. He sang one song, brought the place down. I'm sure. Then, wow. Know, they, all, <laughs> they all live. And so, and then the Bee Gees, I played with in Chicago. Um, there was a tune the Bee Gees had called Lonely Days. It was one of their big, big hits. And it starts with the cello line. Mm. So, you know, there's a chord and the cello start. The crowd goes wild before they even sing a note. <laughs> and we were like looking at each other like, yeah. But you know, just because they recognized what the song was going to be. Yeah. Oh, how and, cool. Uh, that was fun. Cool. Yeah. Uh, my mom uh, is and was a, a huge Bee Gees fan, so she'll she'll love that story. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's a truth, a, a true statement. So we're down to two, and uh, I, I am gonna go ahead. Maybe I'm, I'm this is a trap, but maybe I'll fall in the trap. I'm gonna say that statement C that you never practice more than three hours a day. I'm gonna say that's a lie. Of course, it's a lie. Okay. <laughs> Yes, you're a very intelligent guy, Raul. Um, I don't think anybody who wants to play very, very well, and no matter how efficient you are, as you said, or what a brilliant teacher you have, um, no one is ever going to get very far if they only practice three hours a day. Now. Yeah. I often have parents ask me, how much should my student practice? They often ask me. Sure. And what I always say is, it's not the number of hours, it's what you do in the hour. Right. Or two hours or three hours. It's how you use the time, how well, in fact, the best thing I can do with a student is help them learn how to practice productively and efficiently so you get something done. Mm. Starker had the highest standards of anybody I ever met. And the music majors at Bloomington, Indiana, he would say, practice for four hours a day. The first hour you practice your etude by Popper or Piazzi or something. The second hour you practice your Bach suite. The third hour you practice your concerto or solo piece that you're working on. And in the fourth hour, turn off the light in your room and just play and try to remind yourself why you did the first three hours in the first place. Mm. And of course, four hours is not enough either if you really have a very difficult piece to learn. But one of the things that uh, Starker taught all of us was how can you get it done in one or two hours what somebody else might take 10 or 20 hours to accomplish. Mm. So, so it has to do with these days, a very popular word is mindfulness. Sure. Um, to practice with intention and focus and uh, awareness. So, and so what I always tell my, my students' parents is, uh, the idea is to make progress from one week to the next. And in that case, it's probably enough. I mean, I will ask a student sometimes, how much did you practice this week? And they're usually pretty honest with me. Sure. <laughs> and then sometimes I'll say, I don't think that's enough, you know, or, or uh, maybe we need to talk about how you could work more. Sure, yeah. yeah. And I guess the students, when you talk about younger students, as they get older, and, and they start to envision a path for themselves. If that path is going to be music performance, then they should, you know, increase the, t the amount of time that they spend practicing, but also keep learning how to be better at practicing. Uh, and, and those, yeah, yeah. Okay, now you have to tell me about Fingers Buvona. <laughs> <laughs> well, after I left Bloomington, I told you I started getting some work in Chicago and I was 18 and 19 years old. I got a call from Paul Winter, who still is around and plays in a group called the Winter Consort. 
And he played then, and kind of still does, what now people sometimes call uh, world music or new age music. Sure. Uh, I don't like these <laughs> labels. But Paul was a, a jazz alto sax player, and then he developed his own sort of style and original compositions. And he asked me if I wanted to go on tour with his group because the cellist was not available or something. So for months, I played all over the south, the deep south of the United States, the eastern part of the country, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, sure. uh, Florida, all over the place, colleges. We would play a concert. We would get in. We had like a converted ambulance, and maybe we also had like a converted hearse. <laughs> we did not have a, a glamorous tour bus. There were about six people in the band, and we would drive to the next town, and then the next night we'd do it again. Sure. And I learned, hey, it's really kind of fun to travel and play concerts, but it's not that glamorous. I mean, it's exhausting. Sure. And uh, so sometimes they would ask us for autographs. <laughs> And I remember Doc Severinsen used to be the band leader on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I think once in a while he would, either there was a guy in the band named Gus Bavona or Doc Severinsen who was an Oregon guy, you know, he was from Oregon. Sometimes I think he would call himself Bavona just for a joke and it was fun. So sometimes I would just sign my autograph, Fingers Bavona, <laughs> because they didn't care who I was. They didn't have an idea. And I had, you know, hair out to here. And, and uh, in fact, because that was the case, and it was the late 60s, um, we had some interesting looks and run-ins with some people, sure, especially sure. in the South, you know, mm, mm. because we were a bunch of, you know, hippie-looking people. Yeah, and, yeah, and, uh, yeah. But I had great adventures playing with Paul Winter and, yeah. and also... Glenn Moore was one of the bass players who played with, with them. And Glenn, for a while, taught at Portland State. And Glenn is a great jazz player. And I met some really fantastic musicians and, and uh, had some <laughs> great experiences touring with them. But yeah, that was just me being silly and kind of a, you know, wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really fun. <laughs> Oh, uh, Hamilton, one more thing before I have to let you go. Uh, and this is our sound advice segment. And my question to you is, if you could travel back in time all the way to when you were a teenager, uh, you know, playing the cello, and, and uh, what advice would you have for yourself back then? The first thing that comes to mind is... Uh... Be forgiving of yourself mm. um, and work harder than you think you have to. Okay. Okay. So I always say to my students, playing an instrument is a great opportunity to learn to forgive yourself because you will make thousands of mistakes. And if you take those to heart and, oh, I played out of tune, I'm a bad person. I always tell my students playing out of tune does not make you a bad person. You just have to fix it. Yeah. But if you don't fix it, then, then that's a problem. Um, and I think uh, I would also say uh, find a balance because there were times in my life that I said, okay, either I'm going to practice six hours a day for the rest of my life or I'm just going to go party and not practice at all. Hmm. These are two impossible extremes. Sure. Neither one is really reachable. But if you say, just work harder. If you miss a day, don't kick yourself. Just try to do some good work the next day. Yeah. Then uh, you keep moving forward. And uh, and then I think uh, 
I might have been happier at certain times if I had heard that advice. Sure. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Hamilton, thank you for spending time with us at the MYS Virtual me. Hangout. It's, as always, it's been lovely talking to you. And I look forward to seeing you again in person after this whole pandemic thank thing you. is behind thank us. You. And uh, yeah. see you on stage performing and also maybe for a cup of coffee over at, uh, at Park Avenue Cafe. Where... I would love that. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Hamilton. See you later. See ya. That was Hamilton Chaffetz, professor of cello at Portland State University and so much more. Thank you all for watching. I will see you next week, Thursday at 4 p.m. with another amazing guest. And check out uh, the next screen. You'll see our upcoming guests as the credits roll at the end of this Hangout number 53. Thank you again. Stay safe.